Hello, welcome to another episode of A Year of Brian Eno. So I'm up to now November of this diary. I've just finished November. So basically I've only got one more episode of this series, which will go out in the new year, and then I have to think of something to do. I think now I'm on a bit of a roll and I want to do a, another yearly themed series. It's probably going to revolve something around books. I'm thinking about doing something related to, to library books actually, but we'll see see how that goes i'm going to play around with the idea in my head anyway back to what this series is actually about so anybody that's not watched any other videos in this series i do encourage you to go back and watch the very first episode i think i called it something like episode zero um there is a playlist for it as well so i'm just going through as i said checking out um you know on a daily basis the entries for the diary for on a corresponding day in 1995 which was when the the diary was kept and uh, yeah quite a few things come up in November obviously I don't end up talking about everything in this episode anyway but yeah, there's lots of things that really caught my eye and, and made me think about stuff particularly around that time uh, I've updated the album playlist for 95 which isn't um, just Eno stuff it's like every album well not every album but um albums that i think are interesting that were released in 95 in chronological order so i've just put into that list now uh, november's albums also there's a singles playlist in spotify i'll include links in the description to these um, where i feature all the new entries in the uk charts each month in the top 20 because i found that gave, gave me a really interesting uh, nostalgic um vibe but from a different angle by just doing the new entry stuff uh, because a lot of the stuff in where i worked we had the radio on in the background and it was at um, chart stations and they really heavily focused on new entries in the chart so it was interesting to i felt i really did cap the capture the the musical zeitgeist from a sort of chart perspective pop charts perspective so that, that's interesting putting that list together and of course that'll get finished off at the end of the series where i add in december's so yeah lots of interesting things came up this month in 1995 in november i know it seems like i've only just released the previous month's one but i have to apologize the previous month's one in in october that i did just got pushed on a little bit uh, because of all the other stuff that I wanted to release uh, as well. There was like a uh, Magic the Gathering set that came out that had an effect as well. So, Right, let's dive in and, and just talk a little bit about the sort of things that, that caught my eye in the diary. As I said, there's, there's lots of things he t talks about and it's really interesting to see th that sort of um, lens, if you like. So the lens through... The 1995 through the lens of Brian Eno's diary. Um, so it's quite select about what he talks about. Some days it's pretty slim pickings. Other days there's quite a lot in the entries. And of course, uh, if you don't know, there's a second bit, which is what this joke revolves around as well. A bit of a double meaning in the title. He didn't have appendicitis in that year, but someone he knew did. Um, but... There's a second part of the book which the diary references, which are like essays on different subjects, which I haven't been really covering in this in this series. Interesting book to read. Um, probably makes more sense if you are obviously a Brian Eno fan. Um, but if you if you lived in that time, particularly in the UK, um, then yeah, I would say take a look at it. You you, you might, might be really interesting. So covers the year 95 originally came out in 96 i believe there was a like some sort of anniversary edition or um yeah or something yeah it says here 2021 there was a version came out i've got the ebook version so with that introduction over let's get into this so a lot of talking about this program cohen I've mentioned it in previous episodes and I'll include a link to all of these. So, yeah, it mentions about, you know, particular entry, entry, attention, sorry, attention of Brian Eno. Yeah, so there we go. It's even so cross references in here. So, yeah, really interesting. Uh, and the more I think of it, 
I'm sure I heard this mentioned at the time. Um, uh, I probably said this on numerous occasions, but at this point in my life, I was working for Radio Rentals in an accounts office doing uh, EPOS till support. And it was a really cool environment. The people there were lovely. And uh, I did the helpline I worked on were really, was really cool because I think um, we had three other people on the helpline were actually musicians as well. So that was really cool. So we were talking about music all the time. And um, it was nice because everybody had different musical tastes. There was a guy on there who actually was in was the team leader while I was there um, um, for a period. And he was a lead singer in a thrash band or a, I suppose it would be more of a groove metal band by then because we were well into thrash. So he was big into heavy music and um, there'll be a mention... A, a shout out to a recommendation that he made to me actually in this episode. I had another friend who was um into um big in who's a vocalist who was really big into uh recording digitally um using I think it was like Ataris and he was very much into I suppose a lot a lot of different things but like pop dance um but also just production work. And I did a few, like, not so much musical collaborations with him, but, but yeah, I did work with him. I played, like, a, a backing guitar track on his one of his demos, I think. And uh, we, we messed about uh, over the years on what we called serious music, which was basically us trying to write music and then ending up just having a laugh and uh, messing around. And then there was another friend who, at that point, was in a a band which was an indie band but they had an interesting combination of he played acoustic only and then they had a lead, um another guitarist singer who uh, said said all, most of his stuff went through a rack system so it was this really interesting contrast of stripped down acoustic guitar albeit amplified through the PA and a more effects laden guitar as well and they were a bit more sort of indie um, I'm trying to think of the name of the band now because I did have one of their CDs. The name of my uh, work colleague who was in the thrash, but thrash band, uh, groove metal band, they were called Rife. But the other one was, I think, called Nod, I think, was the name of the other band that were more indie. Um, and my friend that was in production had a was in a number of different bands over the years, actually, both in... Australia, which is where he came from originally, and uh, in the UK. So, yeah, where I'm going with this, because it's, it's brought a big smile on my face, just remembering all those people, yeah, super cool people on the helpline. Um, we used to have such a laugh. And, uh, yeah, I just remember the conversation. I'm sure we, we were talking about, um, you know, electronic generated music, which was in its infancy then. Uh, I think all of us were also big into computer tech so you know <coughs> excuse me there was a lot of stuff around that as well at the time because there were other programs that you could use to generate music as well um yeah there's mention of this this actually came out on the 6th of november 95 so it just been released and there's a lot of a bit of talking about reviews around this as well and uh, he'd been working on this with ut for quite a while and the you know the the previous parts of the diary talk a lot about working on this album as well. So there's a mention because it's November of, of Guy Fawkes Night, Bonfire Night, as, as uh, he's referring to it. So I include a link to that. I don't want to go into the, the details of all this. It's just, um, yeah, huge um, story all around this. And also, there's um, if you've ever been to Lewis Bonfire, you'll know there's also wider connections as well to do with, um, um, how can we put it, um, religious animosity in the UK between, you know, what would have been at the time or and before and after um, uh, conflicts within the different, um, or sorry, between the different uh, religious elements in the... In the um, in, in Great Britain 
uh, in the UK. So yeah, so I'll include a link to that if you if you've not if you're not aware of what Guy Guy Fawkes and I is. But he does mention uh, about Bonfire Night in in one entry, just in passing. Also, bizarrely, there's an entry about aircraft camouflage. I'm not quite sure why he's um, studying it, but he talks about buying a book, um, one of those um, ones on like military um, military aircraft. I don't know if it was a a Jane's book. So I'm just flicking back here now to. Uh, yeah, the, sorry, the Encyclopedia of Modern Warplanes, that was it, where well, he's looking at camouflage patterns for some reason. I can't remember seeing anything else in November as to why he was doing that, but maybe I, I missed it. But, uh, yeah, I, I, at some point I did become pretty fascinated by camouflage, actually. Um, this always reminds me when I see pictures of this. I always remember um, growing up when we used to go and say with my granddad who he was in the Met uh, during the war but ultimately for a period of time had to train on uh, Lancaster bombers although he didn't end up um, he was training to be an engineer but um, during that period um, there was uh, an increase in in tax on London um, through things like the flying bombs the V1s and the V2s so he was actually pulled back because they were now having problems in uh, in the metropolitan area in London, um, with just dealing with all the uh, you know the, the, the carnage through the bombs and everything else. So so a lot of uh, people from the police force that had been in, drafted into the air force were then sent back, and that happened to him. So he actually trained as an engineer on bombers. And um, where I'm going with this is is I always remember we used to make these. Uh, airfix kits when we used to go and visit my grandparents in the summer and uh, uh, my parents always gave us money to buy kits and um, me and my three brothers uh, when we stayed there we used to sit down with him around the kitchen table and spend uh, part of the holiday making the these sort of things and painting them and putting the decals on so whenever I think of camouflage again I always think of that Uh, yeah that was uh, he had some like handcrafted balsa wood ones that he'd done during training of certain things. I think he had, uh, I'm trying to remember what he had. I think he had one of a Hawker Hurricane that he'd done. And there was a couple of others as well that he'd been working on. Which he'd done with some uh, like balsa wood and um and a knife i think yeah so and there's a mention about uh, the q awards uh yeah this 95 one he well the two things connected with him that the help album that he was involved with which is a charity album and also this inspiration award Interestingly, Tricky got an award that year as well. I'm a big fan of Tricky, actually, the, particularly the first couple of albums. And and his work with, um, oh, was it Massive Attack, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was Massive Attack, yeah. So, yeah, they were the award winners that year. Best Act in the World Today, R.E.M., Oasis, Best Live Act, Best New Act, Supergrass. And Blur the Great Escape, yeah, 95, um, Britpop was in full swing. So the Q Awards, if you're not familiar with them, uh, annual music awards run by the music magazine Q. (laughs) There's been a few, uh, yeah, things happen at those awards. I can't remember if that was a particularly contentious year or not, I don't think so. But obviously that was televised. I think at some point. Um, yeah, this gets... Well, so this didn't come out till 96, but he's he's already mentioning conversations he's in with Elvis Costello um, about working on something to do with the X-Files musically. So they're just starting to talk about that. So, yeah. And I, you see... Uh, 
My Dark Life. I don't think it specifically mentions that, but uh, yeah, there's definitely they're definitely in preliminary talks about this. So I'll include links to this and Elvis Costello. This was one of about three albums that came out one after the other. So this actually came out first in 96, I believe. Then they had this, which was the soundtrack to uh, to the series. And then they had this. I had, I think I had this one. Oh, hang on. So let me check this. Yeah, no, I, I bought this one. So there was a succession of these ones, one after the other. But they didn't start until, like I said, 96 was the the year that they... Um, they appeared, as I said, in the 95 diary. He's mentioning about um, Elvis Costello, chatting with him about you know, potential music for the album. So I'll include a link to Elvis Costello if you're not familiar with him. There's also this interview, which does get mentioned in passing, this infamous interview on um, BBC, like a documentary, 20th of November, 95, 54-minute programme, where... Princess Di was interviewed by Martin Bashir and there's been a whole load of yeah stuff that came out in 2020 surrounding this um, and the whole way it was set up so I'll include a link to that if you're not familiar with that um, yeah so obviously this went out before um, you know the accident uh, where you know, tragically took the life of um, Diana um, so that would have been I think when the accident was 97, 98, I think. So this went out in November 95. Yeah, no, sorry, August 97. Yeah. Also, he mentions, and this isn't the first time I don't think it's been mentioned, is Photoshop. But I thought I'd bring this up because there's a little side sort of tech nerdy thing here, if you're into these sort of things. I, I'd... Bizarrely, um, I am always quite fascinated by who owns the rights to different software. Um, I don't know why, but it just fascinates me how software sort of changes hands, gets rebranded. Um, but what happened here, not so much changed hands, but I, I didn't realise this, but uh, Adobe had purchased the, um, or sorry, they had an arrangement with Thomas and John Knoll, um so they would get a royalty every time um, there was a copy sold. But in 95, in March of 95, that year, they purchased the rights for that for 34.5 million. So Adobe didn't need to pay a royalty to them. So yeah, Adobe effectively bought the uh, the, royalty, the royalty, the rights, however you want to think about it, um, from these two people it doesn't specifically mention that in the diary i don't think but it does talk a lot about photoshop and in november he's talking about both uh, his use and i think the kids using photoshop and he's been talking on a, on and off about photoshop and it was interesting because during this period um or prior to this i just bought my first computer so i was well aware of the pdf format and then towards the end of this he's talking about um I just Tracy Emin always makes me smile. <laughs> She's uh, such a she, yeah. She really knows how to push people's buttons. Um, so yeah. Anyway, let's just we won't get distracted by Tracy Emin. We'll talk a little bit about her in a moment. So ninety five was uh, the year that Damien Hurst awarded the uh, was awarded the Turner Prize. And uh, yeah, Brian Eno did give a talk. At the presentation, I, I believe it was televised because he's getting several people commenting on the uh, on his Turner Prize speech. I think he was actually, um, yeah, he was really fussing over the speech before. He seems to have spent at least one, uh, yeah, one or more days with um, uh, insomnia as a result of worrying about over uh, worrying over the the speech. Um, yeah, so. So there's a little bit around about 28th of November where he's talking about, you know, the speech and um, just, again, a lot of the times he, he makes like observations about things. So he's talking about being in the 
the dinner table there and who was around him. Uh, yeah, so, so that's quite interesting listening to the, you know, who was there. Oh, Zeevan, yeah. Uh, he's actually got the speech written out in the diary as well, which I won't read out here. Uh, so. And then the, on the 29th of November, he's talking about the responses. <laughs> apparently he's been getting stopped in the street and people, someone apparently, there's a quote here which he says, it was the only good thing in the program, referring to his speech. So yeah, I'm sure people had very heavy opinions about um, about that. And yeah, if, you, if you're curious, the, the infamous um, My Bed um, thing was uh, 1999. Yeah, I remember that. I thought it was a lot older than that, but uh, yeah. I used to watch these as well, these live not Channel 4 discussion programmes. Uh, as well and uh, yeah the one a couple of years later she <laughs> yeah drunken Tracy Emin uh, yeah. anyway I'll include a link to the, to this article so. in terms of uh, yeah what was going on generally around that time I'll include links I won't go through all of these individually that's something really um, yeah leaps out at me as I'm just I've got it up on the screen and uh, I'll include uh, links to, to these so you can get a basic background of, um, you know, the, the, the world in no November 1995. It's interesting here, it says that the Operation Desert Storm officially ended. Oh, look, Toy Story as well. Cool. And Pioneer. I am fascinated by these sort of probes, actually. Things like, you know, the pioneer probes and those sort of things that uh, like are out there and they've just been travelling through space for a very long time now. Think of the technology that was used at that point as well. Like, And, it, you know, in the case of some of these probes, it's still working. That's just incredible. Like, yeah. What have we got here? I was just, yeah, video games I like to look at occasionally in these episodes because I sometimes start to notice stuff. So, where's it gone? I did see one. Oh, The Dig. I remember seeing um, cover s stories for that because I think at that point I was probably buying PC Magazine. And I think maybe PC Plus still, I'm not sure. And I remember this, yeah, I remember Worms, because I think there was a, there may have been a stripped down shareware version of this kicking around. Oh, that's, sorry, I've jumped ahead of myself, that should I really be talking about next month, that's December. Yeah, so from from this, from November really, just the dig. So BBC Television, I don't think he, well, yeah, he mentions this in in his diary definitely the uh the interview with the uh princess of wales of course this went out as well the twin F peaks firewall with me which is the prequel to the twin peaks 92 was the original twin peaks and then 95 in the uk was when this went out oh network television premiere of the bodyguard wow so that was originally from 92, yeah, 92. And that showed on uh, network TV in the UK in 95. Just shows you how long it took for films to end up on the, on the, on the networks in the UK. I mean, obviously, I'm assuming this had turned up on satellite before then, but yeah. Oh, and this was pretty cool. This uh, comedy with Rowan Atkinson. Not sure what it was on his timeline, but I'll include a link to this section so you can uh, dig down if you're 
Rowan Atkinson fans. Okay, film-wise, again, I don't remember going to the cinema a lot at this point, but um, some of these I would have watched after the fact, things like Ace Ventura and Goldeneye. Yeah, remember that going out on TV at some point in the future. Probably had the video to that. I don't know if I watched that or not. Oh, Toy Story, of course. As was already mentioned, that uh, was released. Yeah. So really, I think Toy Story, Casino, GoldenEye, and Ace Ventura, the ones that I just recognise in terms of the names. What have I got? Memory of Trees. Interesting. Oh, I shouldn't have closed that. Let me, yeah, I'll revisit that. I always sent save the music bit till last. So here's what, um, where are we, November, so big things in November. Yeah, Made in Heaven got released by Queen. So that was released quite a while after Freddie Mercury's death. Put together with, you know, vocals from previous sessions. Yeah, so one thing I did want to do, which I forgot, is let's look at uh, 1995 in music rather than just music so Alba is released here we go yeah I was just looking at in your album because I couldn't um, I didn't I couldn't remember what was on it okay so going down what do we notice so we've got yeah made in heaven by Queen came out early in November so it's quite a, you can see this and not surprisingly we got I think I've spoke about this before we got the lead into December so you're seeing a lot of compilation albums try start to appear get released around that time um, so there's an Amy Mann in terms of studio albums there's an Amy Mann album out that I remember at the time um, this was probably my favourite album uh, from that time something to remember it's a compilation album but it's got three new tracks on it yeah, it's really cool. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it it covers a really interesting period in her in her career. So there's a lot of slower stuff on there. Um, let me go down to the track section. Yeah, so it's got if it's of an album or. A, yeah, you know, some of these are tied into to um, films as well. Yeah, yeah, cool album. It's one of my favourite compilation albums, even though it sort of covers, you know, I suppose deeper tracks, but they had quite a a number of singles off of there as well. Yeah, yeah, you'll see. That's off there as well. Okay. Yeah, There's the third Alice in Chains album as well. Gangsters Paradise came out then that month. This album. So this was cool because this is what got me back into extreme music. Um, I'd gone down re various Britpop, um, indie pop, um, shoegaze, grunge rabbit holes prior to, to this. And then one fateful day, um, 
uh, the, the uh, team leader on on the uh, radio rentals on the helpline I was working on, who was in the the sort of thrash stroke um, groove metal band I was mentioning uh, earlier on in this video, brought in uh, a cassette copy of this because we were talking about Fear Factory and Machine Head, and he said, "Oh, did you check? You know, had I checked out any of the, the sort of newer." style of metal like the, yeah particularly those two bands and i said no i wouldn't mind he said oh i can i'll do a tape if you give me a tape i'll do a tape for you so yeah we uh he got me this tape with this on and that that pushed me back um and then the big period for me was i think uh, 97 when i picked up a copy of terrorizer and it had uh, 96 the year in 96 are the best albums and i just proceeded over the next few years to just buy every album in that terrorizer 1996 list um yeah so and around the same time i i think i bought one copy of terrorizer actually not um early on and so that pushed me back into to i mean i was still listening to you know hard rock metal anyway but not i hadn't i wasn't following the what would you call it like the genres the sub genres quite so much like i used to uh in the 90s and there's still a whole i've still got a whole like um you know the sways of album from the 90s um in the various sub genres that i just haven't got around to listening to i've actually dug out a special issue that terrorizer did after the fact um in the 2000s and um yeah i've uh i'm gonna they did an not issue about the 90s and i keep meaning to go through that systematically and it's sitting on my co on the coffee table here at the moment actually so yeah i've uh yeah i want to go back through and uh re check out the stuff i missed um so maybe we listen to this album again what else we got oh there's the passengers album Bonnie Rare had an hour live album out. Sunny Day Real Estate. That was their second album. LP2 it was called. Hadn't re hadn't got into them at that point. I uh, wasn't aware of them. That didn't happen until a lot later, actually. That was a result as a result of a special issue of. Um, uh, what was it now? Which I think of the other big rock, hard rock metal thing in the UK. Kerrang! Um, I stopped collecting Krang systematically after about issue 50 but I used to buy the occasional one there was one issue which had um, like these lists of certain genres and sub, sub genres within hard rock and metal and it would like 10 albums to listen to and there was um, an album with some sunny uh, a list sorry with some sunny day real estate on it it's foolishly I threw away years ago that copy of the, I've still got the list written down but I, I threw away the copy of those. I don't know why I did that. Um, I think I just got rid of any of the random issues of Kerrang! I bought and just kept the, the first 50 issues. Uh, I don't know if so E17 were coming to the end of their run. Yeah, last to feature the original lineup. Oh, this. Slaughter of the Soul at the Gates, classic album. Um, yeah, I didn't get to listen to that till um, way after it came out. Um, I was a bit back to front in my appreciation of Swedish melodic death metal or European uh, melodic death metal, generally because I probably got into Arch Enemy first, um, like the Black Earth album, and sort of worked my way back from that point, I think. Yeah, I'm not sure about the order exactly. Uh, it's debut by Biff Naked. Yeah, Memory of Cherries by Enya. I was trying to re see if I could recognise some tracks off of that. It's dismissed by Al Cool J. And I'll include a link to this as well. Electronic Pleasure by Entrance. I'd listened to them for the first time actually since... 95 probably when they were, if they had us any stuff on the radio around that time and i definitely want to listen to some more of this as well 
the way class does yeah there's all these really interesting electronic groups from the 90s as well from the from the uk like kicking around and this is a band i i i really like osric tentacles i'm not sure when i listened to their first track but i'd had friends um that were always on about this band and uh, i never checked them out <clears throat> and then finally uh, I checked them out around about yeah I must have done it retrospectively because which Jurassic Shift was it there used to be an album on a local jukebox at the at a pub underneath the club I used to go to I used to go to a place called the 101 Club in East Grinstead which had live bands and at that point, I was going there quite a bit. And uh, a load of us from work used to meet up. Uh, and also uh, people that I used to work with in my previous job as well. And um, they used to have some number of different things on there, on the CD jukebox at the time. But one of them was this, uh, was an album by them. And... Uh, I'm just trying to find, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I probably got into them around this time and then bought, yeah, I remember this album. So I think I ended up owning these two, possibly, um, And but it, again, they were retrospective purchases. So I was dip into Osiric Tentacles. Um, now again, they're a really interesting band. They're one of these bands that, that grew out of a sort of cassette, um, you know, releasing their stuff on cassettes, um, like the, the festival um, circuit as well, particularly playing. They're a mainly instrumental rock band, the psychedelic rock, progressive rock, space rock, all mixed in there. Fantastic guitar sounds, um, really interesting rhythms in there as well. And um, yeah, we yeah, definitely... If you've never checked them out, I'd, I'd check them out. Um, yeah, they're a cool band to listen to. And occasionally I'll, I'll uh, just go on Spotify and check out an album I've not not listened to by them. But I do have a bit of a soft soft spot for space rock. So like things like you know, really early UFO. I mean, I like you know, pretty much all of UFO's output different occasions incarnations of years ago, but i do really like the early space rock stuff and also i'm partial to a bit of hawkwind as well um so if you like you know if you like hawkwind like space rock and you haven't checked out osric tentacles definitely give them a give them a go and there we have it thanks once again for watching bye for now and i will catch you in the well the, the next and final episode of this a year with swollen appendices when I, I do the December one um, sometime in early January of, wow, 2024. So thanks once again for watching. Bye for now. And uh, yeah, catch you in the next one.